to be honest. I didn't I didn't know any worship songs. I didn't know how to you know lead worship or anything. So I started to watch YouTube. Started to watch other worship leaders. I, I, I watched Ruben Morgan, Darlene Check. So then after that service, this old lady walked up to me and she said, "Do you know what your problem is?" And I was like, I was I was so angry because I was like. You know, I, I, I felt like she was my problem almost. But but she said, like, this is probably the first time you're worshiping this week, is it? And then she said, I think you're standing and thinking a lot about yourself and not so about, much about the people you're leading. This is the Hillsong Creative Podcast, where we hear from creative experts, influencers, dreamers, and doers, what they've learned and what we can learn from their journey as we explore, respond, and create. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. This is Rich Langton, your host. I'm so pumped that you've joined us and I'm so glad that we get to do this together. If you haven't subscribed already, I want to encourage you to do that up front so you don't miss out on the journey because each episode that we do is building on on the others and we're building quite a strong community of people who are listening and uh, who are encouraging each other around creativity and how that can fit into the journey that God has for us. Now for today's interview. If you know the song Cornerstone and you've sung that in your church, you may not know the person who wrote it, but today you'll get to meet him. It's Eric Leggero. He wrote that song with a couple of other people and he talks about the journey of that in in the interview. But you'll get to know Eric from a wider perspective. He is a leader, a worship leader, a creative, and a man of God. And I think his story and the interview that you're about to hear will be encouraging and motivating and will really spur you on in your journey. So let's get into it. Okay, so Eric, it's so good to have you here. Um, what we know about you so far is that you are the creative pastor of Hillsong Sweden. Is that right? Correct. That's you it. are married and you have two children, two boys. Right, two boys, one wife. Okay, one wife. That's good. That's good. Eh? Positive. <laughs> um, your children, what, what are their names? Uh, Adrian is seven years uh, and Matteo okay. is two years old. Very cool. So how long have you been the creative pastor in Sweden? Well… I'm not 100% sure when, when I started to. Like, I, I was a part of our church when we started in Sweden 11 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And I feel like a couple of years down the road, uh, we probably started to call what I did. Okay. Creative pastor. But I feel like I, I did it from the start. Yeah. I love that. So did you have a moment, like, growing up where you realized this is this is something I'd really love to do? Like, a defining moment where you said, you know, I can see myself doing something like that or is it completely out of the box it was completely out of the box like i mm-hmm. was growing up um i know what i wanted to, to work with music yeah. i wanted i know i wanted to write songs and you know be on stage and stuff like that so even from when i was 5 or 6 years old yeah. but then sort of never saw myself doing the worship thing mm-hmm. to me that was a genre uh, yeah. and i felt like i didn't want to do that i want I, I wanted to do like smart christian music like don't use words like god and jesus too much but more okay. like you so it could be a love song to dog or a cat yeah. or to god yeah and i thought that was a really smart idea <laughs> but uh, as i growed um I sort of like I'm never like I never chased this, mm-hmm. and the story is a bit heavy to be honest because I I never sort of received Christ in my life, but yeah. I was on Christian stages, mm-hmm. I was doing like Christian pop music and stuff like that. I, I didn't know the whole church game if you know what I mean. Yeah, but never uh, encountered Christ. So like I've started to develop this double life sort of where mm-hmm. I would be on stages on Friday nights singing and talking about Jesus, and then next night like do, doing. Every, Everything that I told people not to do. So, like, after a while, after a couple of years, my whole life just crashed, and yeah. I went to the bottom of everything because I had nothing to lean back on, sort of. Mm-hmm. So I went out to this old church in the southern bu- suburbs of Stockholm, which I sort of grew up in. Mm-hmm. And in that church, there's this old Yamaha grand piano, which I spent I don't know how many thousands of hours yeah. as I grew up. And for the first time, I think in my life, I played the piano and I said to Jesus. If you offer it, I need to meet you tonight. And that's the first time I've encountered Christ, in, in, which was pretty amazing, but also pretty um, scary. Mm-hmm. Uh, because like I, I felt like he, Jesus saw everything that I've done and sort of. So like, but um, after a while, just sitting under, I actually climbed under the, the grand piano. Yeah. But after a while, 
under that piano. I climbed up again and tears down my eyes and started to play. And I felt like the Holy Spirit started to talk to me. Not so much actually what he wanted me to do, but more like who I was in Christ, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's amazing. Something I find interesting about like, I guess the creative life, specifically songwriters and musicians, is um, our creativity is so seen, you know? We write a song, people hear it. Um, so much attention can often be given to it. Or as a musician, singer, people are looking to you and seeing you. And so much attention and applause can kind of come with this creative life. And then you tell that story about, you know, sitting at a piano by yourself and having a moment with God. How important is that by yourself time? You know, the moments when no one else is around, do you still think about those moments and do you still try and have those moments? Oh. Such a good question. No, I totally agree with you. I think to me, that's key. It's crucial. My own time with Christ. When I started to like, so after I received Christ, I started sort of like my pastor, Andreas, he asked me if I wanted to lead worship. And to be honest, I didn't, I didn't know any worship songs. I didn't know how to, you know, lead worship or anything. So I started to watch YouTube, started to watch other mm-hmm. worship leaders. I, I, I watched Ruben Morgan and uh, who's Love one of Ruben our worship. Morgan, the yeah. best. He's the best. And then the way he leads worship, if you've seen him, like it's it's with such an ease, yeah. but still like such an authority. And he would whisper through the crowd. He would go like, come on, church, lift up your hands. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, said, I thought to myself, maybe I should play the Ruben game. So, <laughs> I, like, I went I went to this church um, and it's like 30 people in the crowd, average age, 50 years old. It's in Sweden. No yeah. one speaks English. But I'm like in English saying, come on, church, lift up your hands. <laughs> No one is lifting up their hands. And so I'm going back. I'm watching a couple of other worship leaders, Darlene Czech. And, yes, and she that. she had a little bit you know, a little bit harder style, if you know what I mean. Like yeah. she could be like on honest and real with, yes. with the audience and with church. So like I was honest and real. And I didn't fly. Yeah. Either. So then after that service, this old lady walked up to me and she said, Do you know what your problem is? And I was like, <laughs> I was I was so angry because I was like, you know, I, I, I felt like she was my problem almost. But, yeah, right. but she said, like, this is probably the first time you're worshiping this week, is it? And then she said, I think you're standing and thinking a lot about yourself and not so about much about the people you're leading. Mm. And, like, you know, I walked away from that encounter and went, like, she's actually 100% true. So I went back to my old, like, the studio where I lived and uh, had this North Stage keyboard and I started to play piano. And I think for one of the first times, I started actually to see God. Yeah. And then I read in the Bible, First Chronicle, and I'm trying to translate this in, in my head to, to English. It says, like, seek and, and His face uh, continually, mm-hmm. worship Him all the time. Yeah. And to me, that was like what I did for like not a year or two years. And no matter, no matter how much opportunities or other things I got to be on, you know, bigger and bigger stages, nothing compared to that date that I had with God every afternoon with my North Stage in my small apartment. Yeah, I love that. I know that you've written a lot of songs, but one song in particular that a lot of people might know is the song Cornerstone, and you wrote that with Ruben, is that right? And also Jonas. Yeah, that's right. Can you tell us a little bit about how that song came about and what that writing process was like? I'm right. super intrigued because we know that song well. Like churches really all over the world are singing that song. And um, well, how did it start? It's kind of a funny story because I never, like as you write songs and you write songs as well, Hannah, amazing songs. And I, I don't know, like to be honest, like I feel like sometimes I know and I feel like this is going to be like a song that church sings, but, mm-hmm. but we never sing it. Yeah. And then some of the songs that you feel like oh, no one's got to sing this song, mm-hmm. it's actually becoming the greatest songs. And so we wrote Cornerstone in Stockholm, mm-hmm. in this old cathedral. And this is the day after we had a big terror shooting in, in Norway, mm-hmm. which is just like one hour fly from Stockholm. And this guy, he shot 85 young students to death which was like shocking for all of Scandinavia. So we went to this old church, me, um, Ruben Morgan, Jonas Myron, who's, mm-hmm. always, um, who's also a Swedish songwriter and amazing gift to our church. Mm-hmm. And um, so we started to just read the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2. And and uh, from the message, it speaks about Christ being our cornerstone and mm-hmm. you know all of that. So we wrote a song about it and it felt really good. Yeah. It felt really good. So And we did like we did a demo in Stockholm, me and Jonas, and then we sent it to Sydney and Sydney was going to do it uh, on a Sunday night 
um, Hillsong Sydney on a Sunday night for communion. Mm -hmm. And we were so excited. And I remember I was actually in America on a tour with Ruben then. And we were just staying up, staying up late to hear like, how's oh, this song going to do? Yeah. And then the report was like, huh, well, maybe not. A, like it's a good song, but you know, like church didn't really love it. So like we forgot about the song. We didn't mm -hmm. do anything about that song for like a couple of months or three or four months until um, we hit the, um, like February. And Pastor Brian, uh, first week in February, we always do um, something called Vision Sunday mm -hmm. within Hillsong, which uh, is a Sunday where Pastor Brian Houston, who's our senior pastor, speaks to all our rooms all over the world. And that year he sp spoke about Christ being our cornerstone and about like, like pretty much that whole scripture from Ephesians chapter two uh, about that we are called to build a home, sort of, and that God uses us brick by brick and with Christ as the centerpiece. So, and when we heard about this, I think Ruben sent Pastor Brian the song and Pastor Brian said, let's just try it after, after my message. And we did that and we sang it all over the world that day. And it's almost like God was just breathing on it. Yeah. And and I don't know, after that, it just, it just flied, yeah. I guess. Do you still love it when you hear it sung in church? Um, uh, <laughs> Are you used to it now? I'm, I'm, I'm used to it, yeah. but I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't get tired of worship songs anymore. Yeah. I, don't, I, I actually don't because, mm. I, because it's the stories behind the songs that gives them life, I, I think. And I, like, I don't know, like every week, I don't know how many testimonies and emails and Facebook messages I get from people just and telling me how much that mm. song means to them or yes. like this season they're walking through. So like, I'm, no, I don't get tired of it because I know it's not, I didn't write it. Uh, I think Holy Spirit helped us write it yeah. and uh, God was breathing on it. And yeah. it's not like, it, it was not me, Yeah, to be honest. It's, what intrigues me about that story is um, you guys wrote a song. You felt really excited about it and felt great purpose in it. And then the first time it's sung, it kind of, you hear back that maybe it wasn't very well received. And as an artist, as someone who loves to write songs, maybe people listening, they're writers or creative people. I think one of the big challenges out there is, of course, like discouragement with our work, that we pour ourselves into something and then maybe there's no great return or there's not that moment where other people love it as much as you do. What do you do at that moment where you put something out there, you extend yourself and create something, but then it's kind of in other people's hands to a certain extent as to what people think or how they react to it. What yeah. do you do with that unknown kind of space? It's a good question. I think the, I mean, the right answer would probably be like to die to self and mm -hmm. trust God with everything that he's given me sort of and trust that he's got this. The real answer to that question is probably it's a constant fight. Yeah. And it's and it is a constant dying to self. But it's also I think I'm 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 not always good at this, but sometimes, a few times I've been good at it. It is learning from not maybe from your mistakes, but learning from your disappointment sort of yes. and asking yourself the qu like questions like what could I have done better mm -hmm. and even with the songs or like the leadership calls that you take and that didn't really succeed or make it as sure. the way you thought I'm starting more and more in my personal uh, devotion with God like asking myself those questions what could I have done different is there anything in this song that like you know, what mm -hmm. can I learn? What, what what didn't, you know, so maybe use some of the disappointment as fuel Yes. to be even better. I love that. We'll get right back to the episode brought to you by our Hillsong Worship and Creative Conference, which happens in Sydney, Australia every November. It's for every kind of creative, whether you're a musician, singer, a graphic designer, architect, an audio engineer, or video editor. It's a place for the artists of the church to gather together, to worship, to be inspired and refreshed, and to be equipped and trained for your sphere of creativity. Come be a part of everything happening on site, like the exclusive collabs with practical training from our key Hillsong team. The conference has limited spaces, so if you can't make it to Sydney this year, why not join the online conference experience so you don't miss a moment of the main sessions? Find out more details at hillsong.com forward slash WCC. Now, let's get back to the episode. This is Eric Liljero, and this is my Fantastic Four. My favorite way to recharge and refresh is to spend two hours with my Xbox playing NHL 2017. 
In my life, if I wouldn't do what I'm doing now for church, I'd probably work with marketing and like digital marketing. Uh, that uh, interests me a lot. Right now, I'm listening to a Swedish artist that I, you know, it's a shout out to anyone who likes really good pop music. His name is Alvin Gromer. Alvin Gromer. It's on Spotify, iTunes, and anywhere else. The season I'm in right now, it's probably. Um, the fast season, as you know, the fast and busy season. But like I, you know, back in the days I used to say, and this is like a couple of years ago, I, I used to say, well, it is a busy season, and now I, I, you know, I found out that this is more like a busy life and a fast life, and you have to learn how to live and breathe within that season. Okay, so you mentioned before um, that you've been on staff for 11 years since the church started in Sweden. Is that right? Well, I haven't been on staff for 11 years, but I've been full-time. Okay. I'm not paid full-time. I think I've been paid full-time for like seven years, but okay. the first four years so a long time. volunteering. <laughs> Tell me, have there been moments where at different points throughout your career you've needed to kind of reinvent yourself as a leader and kind of get fresh eyes up? Or had moments like I guess big turning points where you realize I need to dig a little deeper or find a new a find a new way of approaching things. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of times where I felt that I was sort of unqualified for the job mm-hmm. I had. To be honest, I think that's on a three, four months journey I come back to that. Sure. And but I think I've learned how to find strength uh, within that feeling of feeling weak and unqualified. I felt like Paul in the Bible, it's almost like he's chasing that feeling. Yes. And he goes, like you can hear him before he's like, he's dropping his big words. He would always go like, I can't wait to you. And I didn't I didn't want my words to be like, to convince you in my own strength, but mm-hmm. by the spirit and strength. So yeah. I've sort of learned to love that unqualified mm-hmm. feeling in my leadership and trusting God. And I, I sense... To me now, if I feel that I got this and I feel if I feel like, oh yeah, I'm qualified, I know what to do exactly, it's normally in the seasons where I haven't stretched enough or have mm-hmm. had enough vision into my life. So sure. no, it's been a lot of those seasons. And and but something that helped me a couple of years ago is I was sitting and listening to Pastor Phil Dooley, mm-hmm. who's our lead pastor in Hillsong, South Africa. And he was speaking on a topic, yes is the answer, what's the question? Mm-hmm. That's uh, and, and it helped me. And he said like, um, like have, you know, he, he, he was teaching about having like a can-do spirit and have a mentality of like going, yes is the answer to have a question before you actually know what the question is. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you're actually going to be really stretched, but it just helps you trust God sort of. Sure. And to me, like that was, that was really helping uh, and 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 to me, like it's been a lot of mistakes as well, and a lot of you know a lot of things in my my way of thinking and doing and leading that I've learned mm-hmm. the hard way. And but I think that's healthy. It's healthy to have people around you that can actually go ahead, I mean, speak into your life and help you to adjust the weak spot, sort of. Like we were in, um, maybe we'll finish with this last story. Like I, we were in. Um, one of my first Hillsong tours that I did with Hillsong Worship, this is maybe seven years ago. And I was traveling down here to Sydney to rehearse for two weeks. And then we were going to Europe to do like a tour. And I remember I was so nervous. And, at, you know, back home, I've, I've rehearsed these songs for a month. Sure. And I know them by heart. And I like, I was so like, I, I mean, I was nervous, but confident coming out of Sydney. I almost walked up to Ruben and went, should I leave my to save? Like I'm, I was <laughs> that confident. And then traveling back to Europe and we're stopping in Singapore to do a worship night for Pastor Joseph Prince and mm-hmm. his church in Singapore. And uh, um, during the day, uh, Phil Dooley, who's traveling with us and preaching, he gathered a couple of the worship leaders and he changes a bit. He, he does a couple of changes in the set list. And I was not in that meeting. So then I'm meeting one of another, not one of our other worship leaders. His name is Ben Fielding. I'm meeting him in that hallway. And he says, Eric, did you hear that Pastor Phil changed a couple of things in the set list? And I said, really? I think that's, <laughs> um, that's, that's a pretty bad plan. And then he, then he looked at me and he said, well, I think it's an awesome plan. And then he starts to laugh, like really bad. And I'm like, 
<laughs> what are you kind of what, what a friend are you? Like, why are you laughing? And then he said, and this taught me so much. He said that if anyone thinks this is a bad plan, just answer, I think it's an awesome plan and laugh. <laughs> and then to me, like it taught me so much to have like a can-do spirit. Yes. And like, yes, is the answer, what's the question sort of. So yes, there's been a lot of disappointments. There's been a lot of, you know, situations where I felt unqualified. But like if God is building this thing, his yes. church, and yes. I'm and I get to work with the thing that he's promised to build, then he got this. That's what I have to trust and and believe. I love that. I love the statement that Eric made at the end there. If God's building it, then He's got it. And it's the same with our lives and the things that we put our hands to. If God's got our creativity, then He's going to build it and He's going to create opportunity for you and for your gift and for your talent and for your creativity. So let's relax into it, trust God and get on with it. Right now, though, we're going to turn to the 100 Day Creative Challenge. And if you don't know what that is, head to hillsong.com forward slash WCC so you can join on the journey. And here's the story of the week. I have three incredible healthy children that I love very much and a few years ago I remember being in a swimming pool with my wife and we had our daughter who was one year old at the time between us, it was very shallow water and it was frightening how fast it happened but all of a sudden I look up and there she was at the bottom of the pool, helpless, her eyes open looking up at me and um, I won't ever forget that look in her eyes because that look screamed, "I, I don't know what's going on right now, I don't know what to do about the situation. Um, but her eyes were fixed on the only one that she knew that could help her. You know, in life, our eyes can be on a whole lot of different things. But to me, that story is the ultimate picture of looking to God for mercy, that we may not know what's going on around us. We may not know how to help the situation, but fixing our eyes on the one who holds the universe in his hand and the only one that we know that can help us. and acknowledging that it's only from Him that I get what I need for life. It's only from Him that I get my breath. It's only from Him that I get my daily provisions. Um, It's only from Him that I get an opportunity to live this day. Not just about when things are going wrong, but it's a daily posture, it's a daily attention. It's our eyes fixed on Christ, knowing who He is and knowing that He's the only thing that we need. Well, that's it for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to subscribe, you can do that on iTunes, YouTube, or SoundCloud. And I'd encourage you to do that so you can be a part of the journey with us. We'd love to hear from you too. So if you want to give us your comments, do that on our Instagram. It's at HillsongWCC. And we'll see you next time. 